I'm John Blair, I'm a professor over in the Department of English, and I've known Scott Johnson for forever. I've known Scott Johnson. I was reading the blurb in the newspaper about him, said that he'd graduated from here in 2002, and I thought to myself at the time, that means I've known Scott for 12, 14 years now. And of course, the, the, the thought that immediately followed that was, gosh, we're old. Um, <laughs> And, and not getting any younger, I'm afraid. When you're a genre writer in the Academy, which, which I am, of course Scott is, Scott doing horror fiction, I, I'm a science fiction guy, or have been a science fiction guy in the past, you, you tend not to get a lot of respect. You tend to be marginalized a little bit, but you know, one of the things they, the great they always say is there's no greater revenge than success. And, uh, <laughs> Scott certainly had that, as, as I'm sure if you're here, you know that, 10 plus books, 100 plus articles, and uh, just lots and lots and lots of people reading every word he writes, which of course is what you want when you're a writer. Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm very much looking forward to hearing what it is he's going to read to us today because he hasn't told me yet. But anyway, the man of the hour, Scott Johnson. Holy cow, there's people. <laughs> um, before I get started, I, I, I want to say, um, when I started here, when I was an undergraduate here was when I started writing, and there were two professors in particular that encouraged me, and so you can feel free to blame me on them. Um, <laughs> Uh, the first one, and these are two fellows that were the first people that made me feel like that the stories that I had in my head were actually worth anything. And uh, the first one was Miles Wilson, uh, who for some reason didn't scream and run out of the room when, I, when he read my first short story that was uh, about a guy who woke up in the middle of the night and found his whole family been butchered. <laughs> it's for the kids. Um, <laughs> the second person, the second professor, uh, that really encouraged me and was a real mentor to me was Professor Blair here, uh, John, and he, uh, I can't think of anybody better to, to, to have been the person to introduce me for this because without you and without Miles, uh, there's no way in hell I'd be standing up here right now. So, uh, what I would like to read to you today are some excerpts from uh, the series that I'm working on now, the Stanley Cooper Chronicles. And just to give you a little bit of backstory, uh, Stanley was a normal, average, everyday guy until he died in a fall. He was declared legally dead for three minutes. And when he came back, he could see dead people. So um, I hope you enjoy it. And this is from the first book. This is from Vermin. And then after I get done with this, I'll read a little bit out of the second book pages. The harness fit tight, and that was good. It meant the nylon straps had me by the legs and back, safe as a baby in his mother's arms. Below me, open air yawned to a backstop of concrete. My feet pressed against the glass, and I leaned into the comfort of my web cradle and raised my caulking gun. Seventy-five panes down, five hundred more to go. I heard a snap, a metallic ping, and then my world went topsy-turvy. The wind whistled in my ears as my stomach tried to climb up my throat and out of my mouth, and I didn't have time to think, didn't have time to react. There wasn't even time to breathe. I'm pretty sure my heart stopped beating. I felt the first gulp from my pulse, and then I swear there was nothing after that. The cable got smaller as I fell away, and all I could think was not now. Not like this. My birthday's next week, for Christ's sakes. I can't... And then my telephone woke me up from the nightmare. It's the same damn dream I'd had every night for the last five years, falling from 30 feet up and coming down hard. I've had the dream so often that I don't wake up screaming anymore. I wake up, wipe the sweat off my face, and go about my business. It's pretty amazing what a person can get used to. I cleared my throat and pulled the receiver off the nightstand. Hello? <laughs> Is this Stanley Cooper? The voice on the other end of the line was female, shaking and scared. Yeah, this is Cooper, I yawned. 
A call from some random stranger wasn't exactly how I wanted to start my day. Mr. Cooper, I... You... Now look, I get stammering phone calls a lot. For some reason, people feel embarrassed about calling for certain kinds of help. No one feels embarrassed about calling a doctor or a priest, but for some reason, people feel nervous about calling people like me. Like maybe the neighbors will hear and think they're crazy or something. Something I can do for you, miss? My tone must have put her off, or at least let her know that I was tired of the stuttering bit. Lack of sleep makes it hard for me to mask my morning grumpies. I'm sorry, she said. This was a mistake. I, I thought since, well, since you helped the McNeils. The McNeils. That name made my stomach roll and my eyes snap open. Memories of yellow eyes and a voice that didn't belong to a 12-year-old girl flashed through my mind. Hold on, I said. Don't hang up. I cupped my hand over the receiver and sat down on the edge of my bed, cleared my throat a couple of times and picked up the pen and pad from beside the telephone. Ma'am, are you, are you still there? There was silence on the line while she debated hanging up. I'm here, she said. How can I help you? I don't want to discuss this over the phone, she said. Yeah, no one ever did. Everybody preferred to meet face to face. Can you meet me at the Carnegie Library in an hour? Sure, I said. You didn't tell me your name. Shannon, she said. I'll be waiting by the main entrance. And the line went dead. Philosophers and songwriters often write about finding the silver lining in every cloud, the good and the bad, that sort of thing. I'm not talking about real philosophical geniuses here like Plato or Ozzy Osbourne. I'm talking about pop philosophers like Dr. Phil or people who write show tunes. Yeah, essentially they're made up of the same type of Pollyanna people. On one side of the coin are people who point out that there's a slight amount of tragedy in every good thing that happens. We found a cure for cancer, but think of all the poor test animals who, animals who died to find it, that sort of thing. Optimists on one side, pessimists on the other. And that leaves people like me somewhere in the middle. I died. And I got better. It's really the only way I can describe my situation. See, both good and bad came from my untimely passing. The good news came in the form of a check from the company that killed me. It was enough that I didn't really have to work again if I didn't want to. Not enough to live in luxury, but enough to buy an apartment in Pittsburgh, pay off my car, and afford cable, and maybe a few other creature comforts. If for anything else, I needed a steady income. Not much, to, but enough to support my video game habit and keep me in imported horror movies. Oh, and did I mention I also see dead people? I'm not sure if that's a good point or a bad point, really, but it's a fact. It isn't like... It, it isn't as if I see cadavers everywhere I go. It's more like I walk into a place and every restless soul that's ever died there comes out to meet me. I'm pretty sure it has something to do with my own passing and returning from the other side, like they want to meet the guy who made it out or something. The trouble is, most of them look exactly like they did when they died. It doesn't make for very happy dinner conversation. I don't advertise my abilities. I never hung a shingle out by the roadside or put an ad in the yellow pages. People pass me on the street all the time and never bat an eye. But people find me all the same. A friend of a friend, an acquaintance of a former client. Somehow they all find me and they all ask for my help. And when a person comes to me quaking in fear and begging for my help, I can't turn them down. For the most part, they're looking for closure, or they want someone to tell them that their house is haunted by more than banging pipes and faulty wiring. Still, every now and again, someone finds me who really needs help. Someone like the McNeils, or maybe the Shannon person. So the Carnegie Library is the second most popular place where people like to meet me. The first is a bar on Carson Street called the Copper Tank. They usually choose the tank because there are so many people that they're there's so many people there that they're likely to be unnoticed. They choose the library for the same reason. I prefer the tank because the library doesn't serve beer. But some folks <laughs> But some folks are more comfortable surrounded by musty books than by hormonal college students. Go figure. So I came up from the parking garage into the cold February air and I saw her straight away. A long black winter coat pulled tight around her shivering frame, hair quaffed just perfectly in a high golden mound, and makeup done to perfection. It matched the quivering voice on the telephone. 
I could also tell she hadn't clue one of what I looked like. Every time she saw a tall, muscular fella pass by, she looked as if she wanted to introduce herself. The hero type, that's what she expected. With just the right mix of brawn and beauty. <laughs> It'd be a serious disappointment. <laughs> Unlike the movie heroes who were built like, coll like college athletes and have charming smiles, I'm short, I'm a little dumpy, I don't have chiseled features, but a round face with a pixie nose that looks sharp, looks sharp enough to cut glass. My hair isn't quite long enough to pull back yet, but it is too long to be manageable, which gives me a crazed look even when the wind isn't blowing. <laughs> a blustery day in February makes me look positively deranged. <laughs> I pulled my coat snug, around, snug against the wind and made my way quickly to the woman. Are you Shannon? As the woman turned to face me, her face melted into a mask of horror. I don't have any money, she shrieked. Get away from me! <laughs> Mr. Cooper? I turned away from the recoiling woman to see a younger girl in fatigue pants and sneakers rising from the, be from the bench. Her sandy blonde hair was pulled back, into her pulled back from her face in a loose knot, revealing freckles and lines of worry. Over her Duquesne University sweatshirt, she wore a navy surplus peacoat. I turned back toward the other woman, who seemed to regard me with more disgust than fear. Excuse me, I said. Mr. Cooper, you must be Shannon. Hi, Stan Cooper. Can we go inside, she said. The way her eyes darted around, it was as if she were afraid she was being watched. It's cold out here. I shrugged and gestured for her to lead the way, and once inside, she made her way into a private study carol and closed the door behind her. I don't really know where to begin, she said. I, I don't even really believe in all this stuff myself. Why don't you just tell me what's going on? I feel like I'm losing my mind is what's going on, she said, a mixed laugh and sob catching in her throat. I think my house is haunted, but it's, it's more than that. There's something weird going on there. As I watched her face, I saw a strong young woman driven down by something she couldn't understand. The color under her eyes showed she hadn't been sleeping well. Her hands shook with fatigue. Somebody else might have thought she was a meth head on detox, but I saw her for what she really was, out of her element and terrified. Hey, 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 I took her hand in mine. You don't have to worry about me not believing you, okay? Just tell me what's going on. It took an hour for her to spill the whole story. She was a student, which I probably could have figured out on my own. She and a group of classmates decided to get a house together to save on expenses. They pooled their resources and managed to buy a rundown house on the south side. There were five of them living together, sharing rooms, and then things started disappearing. That was their first clue that something was wrong. And then there were noises and other signs. She said her roomies were starting to act strange and that she was beginning to feel ill. In fact, they all started skipping classes and just staying inside the house. I asked her why she didn't leave. I have to stay, she said. Yeah, but why? I have to stay. Her tone was the same one an abused woman used, uh, that an abused woman had when she refused to leave her lover. She knew it was bad, but there was something keeping her there, something unexplainable. I agreed to follow her to the house and get a first impression of what was going on. It takes a lot of guts to come forward when something weird or frightening happens to a person. Most people feel like no one will believe them or that people will blame them and laugh behind their backs, and, and most people are right. It leaves people with a sense of hopelessness that there's nowhere left to turn. When people begin to feel that way, those dark forces win. I don't, I don't mean that metaphorically, I mean it literally. They win a victory, a conquest over a soul when a person loses hope. Someone experiencing what Shannon claimed to experience has to be at wit's end to find somebody like me. Most of the time, they dummy up and don't tell anyone, but when it first happened to me and I thought I was losing my mind, sure, I, I mentioned it to a few people, a shrink here and there, a few friends, a bartender or two. My friends stopped hanging out with me. The bartenders cut me off and the shrinks told me I was suffering from some sort of post-traumatic stress syndrome brought on by my passing. They never say death, they always say passing. Passing sounds so much nicer, much less final than death. 